Good morning from the University of St. Thomas. My name is Jackie Anderson and I'm the Assistant Dean at the Opus College of Business. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the kickoff of our 2019 Summer Online Learning Series. Now the purpose of each one of these sessions is to give you the opportunity to start your day with a dose of learning while giving us an opportunity to showcase some of the fabulous faculty that teach within our executive education programs. Now today is the first of a series of three sessions. Our next session is to, titled Design Thinking and will be on Wednesday, July 17th with Professor John McVeigh, who's gonna overview some design thinking tools you can use every day while you face your challenges. Um, if you don't know, Executive Education actually offers over 30 open enrollment programs here at St. Thomas. And they include content from deep specializations such as a coaching certificate, black belt certifications, as well as um, digital marketing certifications, all the way to the most advanced senior leadership development training. All of our programs are portable and can be hosted in-house to your organizations designed to meet your specific development needs. Now, St. Thomas has a reputation for programs, for great programs delivered by scholar practitioners. And really, the scholar practitioners ensure that any content and skills you learn, you can bring back to the office and use immediately. As a matter of fact, our motto is start your Monday smarter. And I guess in today's case, it'll be start your Thursday smarter. So with that, let me tell you about our plan for this morning. Uh, in a moment, I'll have a pl the pleasure of introducing Danielle Hansen, who will be leading our session on preparing for negotiations. Now, um, Due to the number of folks participating, um, we are going to save questions for the end. So anytime during today's session, feel free to um, text or use the chat feature in Zoom and send your questions to our St. Thomas host. Um, also, if you have any technical difficulties, as you noticed, we had one this morning already, please know we are recording this whole session and it'll be made available to you afterwards. Um, and with that, then um, I'm going to kick off uh, Danielle Hansen's session by introducing her. She'll speak for about 45 minutes, and I promise you'll be back to your cup of coffee by nine o'clock. So it's my privilege this morning to introduce Danielle Hansen. Danielle is an adjunct faculty here at the University of St. Thomas. She teaches in both our MBA programs as well as our executive education programs. Um, Danielle has extensive experience in international supplier relationship management as well as contract negotiation. Um, she completed all of her advanced negotiating training at uh, Harvard Law School. Um, and she is uh, currently the director of global strategic sourcing at Coloplast. She's a Tommy through and through. Mm -hmm. She completed her <clears throat> undergraduate work here with a triple major in um, operations management, Spanish, and legal studies. Yes. And you know, she had missed one discipline, so she decided to come back and wrap it up with an MBA in international marketing. It is my privilege to introduce Danielle Hansen, who will be kicking off our summer online learning series. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone. I'm very excited to have you all here. Uh, one of the things that I want to do this morning is talk through specifically, think, stop for a moment and think about what has shaped your negotiation experience. Think about has it been TV, media, has it been people in your life or negotiations that you had actually partaken in? For a lot of us, we would say it's Hollywood that's actually shaped how we negotiate and establish what negotiation is for us. In a lot of those cases, Hollywood has shown us what negotiation is. In those particular situations, Hollywood has shaped negotiation as always being a competitive negotiation. It's one in which everyone is competing for something. And the person that wins that negotiation is the person that walks away with the most stake from that negotiation. What I wanna teach you today is that's truly not what negotiation always is. Now, there are two types of negotiation. There's competitive negotiation and there's also collaborative negotiation. 
Competitive negotiation would be a negotiation, for instance, I'm going to go buy a car. In a competitive negotiation, I care about myself and my stakes in that negotiation. I'm going to most likely see that car dealership salesperson once when I purchase that car. At the end of the day, I don't care about the relationship continuing with that particular person. However, in most negotiations, they're collaborative because that relationship is something that continues throughout. For instance, if I'm in strategic sourcing or if I'm in sales, I have a continuous relationship with that person. So depending upon that negotiation, if I come in with those competitive tactics, it's going to showcase and actually be a detriment to that relationship that we have established. It's going to come back the next time I negotiate with them and the next time, and they're gonna come much more hard or much more difficult with me in those negotiations. So what I wanna show us is what is negotiation? Negotiation is really a dialogue between two or more people or parties intended to reach a beneficial outcome over one or more issues where a conflict exists with respect to at least one of these issues. It's important to note two things, and you'll see them highlighted on this slide. Negotiation's a dialogue. We want to remove that scary piece of negotiation. We want to remove that anxiety. It's truly a dialogue that you're having with another party, one person, or multiple parties. There's a conflict that exists within that negotiation, and we have to figure out what do we do in that negotiation to make sure that we're removing that conflict or we're problem solving to make sure that we're able to remove that conflict. At the end of the day in a successful negotiation, we've removed all conflict that exists, we've problem solved. So at the end of the day, we walk away, both parties collaboratively coming to an agreement that both parties believe is a win. One of the quotes that I really like, if you don't go after what you want, you'll never have it. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. If you don't step forward, you're always in the same place. Now, the reason that I really like this quote is a couple of things. A lot of us are too scared to ask. We're too scared to push forward in a negotiation. Reasons why we've been too scared is because society has told us it's rude to ask for what we truly want. Now, think about this for a moment. Who are the best negotiators? Think through all the negotiations you've participated in. Who is the best negotiator? I'm gonna give you a moment to think about that. Now, if you said children, you'd be absolutely right. The best negotiators are children. And the reason that the best negotiators are children is because children don't have that fear. They're constantly pushing those barriers. They're constantly moving forward. They're constantly making asks that are much higher for what they truly want. Now, children not only do the asking, but they also ask questions. They dig at what specifically is it that I need to know in order to make my next argument. And they're extremely effective at it. Now, I'm gonna give you an example. My daughter at the time was six years old. Now, in my daughter's world, everything revolved around her iPad. Her iPad was the most important thing. I could take any toy in this world away, it would not matter. I take that iPad away, all hell is breaking loose, right? The world is ending, we've got a lot of situations going on. So, we're about to walk into Target that day. My daughter decides to sneak her iPad in and then she's gonna bring it with her. So she sticks it under her arm. Now, my daughter goes to try to walk into Target. Well, I see what's going on, and I say, honey, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to put your iPad down. We're going to have to put it in the glove compartment. We'll make sure that it's in the glove compartment so people don't steal it, right? But I use this as a teaching moment. Honey, we're going to make sure that we put it in the car because we can't bring that in. They sell iPads at Target, and we don't steal. I don't want people to think that you're stealing. Now, my daughter puts her hand on her hips and goes, Mom, I would just turn it on. I'd show them all the apps I had downloaded. Clearly their Wi-Fi is not fast enough in order for me to download all those apps if I just stole it, right? It, so at the end of the day, my daughter's continuing to push that logic, continuing to push forward. She asked multiple questions why she came with great logic. Now, part of me as a parent is patting myself on the back, right? I've got a child that is very, very logical. Now, I'm very excited about that but it's still a teaching moment and we're still putting it in because mama said no, right? But at the end of the day, it's that, it's that inquisitive nature about children. It's the asking those questions, why? 
but why mama? Why can't I bring this in? It's pushing those barriers that we need to get back to within negotiations because that's really how we're going to be successful in collaborative negotiations going forward. Now, one of the principles that I follow is an investigative negotiation principle. So as we're going through this, one of the important things and probably one of the most important things that I'll tell you today is make sure in these negotiations that you're asking questions. You need to be asking those open-ended why questions. If someone's coming with a demand, why is that a demand? We need to be able to push forward and ask those questions to make sure that we're getting more information that we can then use in collaborative negotiations. You also wanna create common ground. When you're creating common ground, it's helping people to feel more at ease within that negotiation. We talked a lot about dialogue and how important it was to have a dialogue as a negotiation. So in this particular case, if we have common ground, we're more able to drive that negotiation away from the competitive nature and more to the collaborative common ground that we've established. The next item is making sure that we're interpreting demands as opportunities. Oftentimes in negotiations, people forget that if the other side's making a demand, it's an opportunity for me to also make a concession or to also get a concession in that negotiation. The last thing you want to do is actually have a demand from the other side and not get something for that demand. There's that trade-off from a concession standpoint that we want to make sure comes through. You also want to understand the other side's wants and needs and the differentiation between whether they're wants or needs. Oftentimes, people talk about a want in a negotiation, but it's not actually that true need that they have. So it's important as you're looking through that to make sure that you're digging deeper, asking those why questions to find out what truly is that need that they have and how can we best fulfill this in this negotiation and solve the problem that's at hand. The last item is extremely important. Make sure that you're helping that other party to sell the agreement back to the other side. Not all of us are great salespeople. And especially when you're negotiating with people, oftentimes they're not able to articulate back to their management team or whoever's responsible higher up for what specifically it is that they were able to get in that negotiation. If you help them sell it back to the other side, they're actually able to bring that back and the chances of that agreement actually going through are much higher, thus not wasting additional time. In negotiations, we want to focus on how do we maximize that value? How do we look past just the one price? You know, oftentimes we get so focused on price, 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 and we miss all these extra things that we could really do to maximize that overall value in the negotiation, not only for me, but for the other party as well. So at the end of the day, we're collaborative problem solvers to make sure that we're maximizing that value in the negotiation. Now, I want to talk a little bit about positions and interests. In negotiation, it's important to identify the position of the person and the interests. So we talked a little bit about this before with wants and needs. When you look at this iceberg example, you will see the positions are up on the top. They're easy to see. So when you're actually in a negotiation, a lot of times those are the things that are being articulated to you. Those are some of those positions, the what that they want. The interests are the why. And that's where we have to ask those questions. We have to figure out and be able to drill in. I look at Lean Six Sigma, you know, asking why questions five times. This is the same type of thing that we need to be doing in negotiations to dig at below the iceberg, below the water surface. What specifically is there that I need to focus on and make sure that I know for this negotiation because that's all gonna help me as I look to build my leverage in the negotiation. Now the value creating negotiation process that you'll see in this next slide here focuses on six different steps that I go through from a negotiation perspective. Now you'll see step one, two, and three are all part of the negotiation planning process, which is what we're talking about today. Negotiation planning, so internal information gathering is your first stage. Really focusing internal to your organization, what additional information can I get? Has there been someone within my organization, either prior to me taking the role, or in the history of these negotiations between these suppliers or companies or people that you're negotiating with that have negotiated with this party or people in this particular negotiation? Because if you have that information, you know what happened last time. 
You know what frame of reference they're bringing into that negotiation and what you need to know specifically about that person and their style or personality behind that. That could affect your overall negotiation. The external information gathering, you're also looking at from company standpoint. What do you need to know about that particular company? Whether this be a hiring or employment negotiation, what specifically do you need to know going into that negotiation about the company? What are some questions that you need to ask that you can really be digging for? Where can I go from a resource standpoint to really make sure that I'm digging in to find additional information? Then we go into the negotiation planning stage, which is where you have the planner. So item number three is really what we'll focus most of our day talking through is that actual negotiation planning process. And part of this, you'll actually see the planner that I use from a negotiation perspective in teaching in my classes. The next item is negotiation. Now, many of you may be looking at this and go, why is this not a linear process? Right? We all like to see value stream maps that are extremely beautiful, that linearly show us what that process is that we need to follow. Now, what I will say here is you see this is more of a cyclical process. And the reason that is, is such is because at any point within this negotiation, you may see that there are things within that negotiation that require you to go back up to one of the previous planning stages. So at the end of the day, I may go through steps one, two, and three. I may get to step four and I'm at the negotiation table and I find out something significant, right? I find out that there's something that changes the game from a negotiation perspective that also changes what my approach would be. I now have to take a pause. I have to go back. Either it is stepping away for a brief break or it's rescheduling that negotiation so that I can actually go back and get additional information that I didn't necessarily have during that planning process because something was brought forward that I wasn't aware of in that process. You'll see step five is sell that agreement to the other side, which we spoke about. You'll also see the last step within that is execute and monitor compliance to agreement. It's extremely important that you are executing that and that you're actually monitoring the compliance to the agreement. You spent a lot of time negotiating, right? We don't want to put that negotiation time to waste by not doing that last step and having that continuous monitoring and compliance to the agreement. There are five strategies in negotiations, and the reason I want to point these out is because you will see them come out in the person or people that you're negotiating with. So part of the preparation stage is understanding your audience, right? Understanding who specifically is it that you're gonna be negotiating with and what type of strategy do they necessarily gravitate towards in those negotiations. So in this particular case, there are five strategies. There's avoiding. I hate negotiation, right? I'm gonna do everything that I can to avoid that conflict. So I'm gonna probably run the other way. There's compromising. Let's just split the difference. We hear this so often in negotiations. Well, you know, this person comes with X, this person comes with Y, let's just split the difference between the two and let's walk away. We're both happy, we ended it nice and quick. What happens in the case where you compromise like that is you're not maximizing that value. So back to that slide that you saw with a nice key lime pie, you're not making that pie bigger. Because when you're compromising, when each person is walking away with half of whatever it may be, we're not getting that maximized value. For instance, in this particular case, say I have two chefs, they're competing over oranges. They each need 300 oranges. At the end of the day, if I say, you know what, you take 150, I'll take 150, what happens at the end of that negotiation? Neither has what they need to make that recipe. They have half of what they need. It's a lose-lose situation. So we wanna make sure that we're not compromising, but we wanna understand, is there someone that is going to be more of the compromising focus? Because that's gonna affect how do we plan what our offers are gonna be, what our counter offers are gonna be, and what leverage we're gonna bring into that. The accommodating is the person that's going to want the relationship over what their actual stake is in that negotiation. The competitive is that hard, you know, competing type negotiation style. This is what I would say is car dealership, right? The car sales is the competitive. And then the collaborative is really, how do we work together? How do we problem solve? You want to understand each individual person that you're negotiating with to understand which of these strategies do they generally gravitate towards. Now you may be kind of scratching your head here going, okay, she's telling me this, but how do I actually find out in the negotiation what that person is or where they're going to gravitate towards because it's extremely important. Now, there's a lot of things you can do around this. A lot of asking questions, a lot of increased contact 
with those counterparts that you're going to negotiate with. Because the more time you're actually spending with that person, the more you're, trying, you're understanding more about them. For instance, our Eastern colleagues do a great job of this. They won't actually start business negotiations until they actually they've done dinners, they've actually gotten to know each other and have that relationship built up. This is extremely important because at the end of the day, if we as Americans look at this as just, okay, another formality in this process that we have to go through, we're missing a great opportunity to find out more about that other person and also to see some of those nonverbals. So when I'm asking a question, I'm not only listening for what specifically is being answered, but I'm also listening for or looking for what are they doing from their nonverbals? Are they looking at me when I ask certain difficult questions? Are they looking away? Are they avoiding some of those questions? It's important that we understand what that is. And if we have more interactions, we're able to understand that and bring that into our negotiation strategy as we're going through. The next thing we need to look at is personality differences. Now you will have the competitive and collaborative that we talked about. You'll also have team versus individual. Does this person focus more on their individual contributions and their individual focus? We're all agents of companies. We all have a stake in the game, whether we admit it or not. So what is it? Is it ego driven? Is it for that next opportunity that's moving up the ladder? What specifically is it about this person that I'm negotiating with that I need to know what motivates them? Because if I understand what motivates them, that's additional things that I can bring into my negotiation strategy. It's additional leverage that I can use when I need it within that negotiation. Now, some of the areas that we had worked through on additional research, if I'm in an employment negotiation, what external sites or what additional information gathering can I do? Now, there's external recruiters. In this particular sense, external recruiters are great sources of information. Not only do they have information about other companies, especially when they're outside of a specific company, they also have information about where things should be from a salary standpoint, where, what's going on in the market at this point in time. Companies' job postings are great because they give you additional information on that. Networking with other people to understand what are some similar positions that I'm going towards and what specifically do I need to know in the terms of the negotiation. Glassdoor, LinkedIn's another great resource within that. So LinkedIn is perfect because at the end of the day, LinkedIn, you can actually see what is this person interested in? What are they following? What type of groups are they involved with? And what specifically do I need to know about that person prior to going into the negotiation? Now, the important thing to note here is LinkedIn, you can also pay a 9.95 fee so that you're not seen when you're actually being viewed throughout the um, profiles. So it's a really good thing, especially if you're going into an employment negotiation because you can do it anonymously. If I'm looking at an external negotiation, there's other things that you can do in other areas of information. There's colleagues that have negotiated with that person or parties that we talked about earlier. You can look at company press releases. What's new in the news that I need to know? Networking is also key and social media, again, LinkedIn is extremely important here as well. So many of you may be asking, why do I actually go through this planning process? You know, I've been negotiating for you know, 15, 20 years. I never prepared for a negotiation. Why do I need to do it now? Now, a lot of you may be asking that, but there's a lot of benefits behind planning for a negotiation. Just as you plan when you're going into a interview process, you need to plan for a negotiation. You need to understand specifically, what is it that I need to be going in? What do I need to ask? What do I need to know going into this? So just as you do research on the company, you also need to be doing that in negotiations. There's a lot of detriments if you're not doing that. Some of the detriments are nonverbal. Now, if I am not prepared to answer a very difficult question that the other side is posing towards me, if I'm not prepared, my nonverbals will show it. It will show that I'm not ready for that question, that I'm not prepared, maybe I'm flustered. Whatever those nonverbals are or I'm avoiding eye contact, that all shows in the negotiation. You do not want to have that in the negotiation. You want to be prepared. The other big detriment that I often work with people on is all of us are constantly moving. We all have a lot of things coming from a focus standpoint. We've got multiple phones, we have iPads, we have whatever that may be from a technology standpoint. It's constantly buzzing, beeping, whatever you wanna say. So our focus is consistently scattered. Now, one of the detriments of this 
is in a negotiation, one of the things that most people do is rather than listening to the other person that's talking and giving me great resources and information, I'm thinking about what am I going to say next? When I think about what I'm going to say next, I'm missing a huge amount of information that I could be using as additional leverage in this negotiation. If I'm not properly prepared, I'm not ready to fully devote myself to listening to this other person. And I'm just going to be focused as quickly as possible on getting through this negotiation, thus not maximizing the overall value that I need. So as we look at the negotiation planner template, you'll see here, you want to lay out and you want to look at this negotiation planner, not only from your standpoint and your company's standpoint, but also from the other side. We want to act like we're on both sides here so we can understand and start putting ourselves in that other party's shoes. So looking at positions and interests from the negotiation, not only for yourself, but also for the other party. You also want to talk about and understand what is your BATNA and what is their BATNA. So if we look at BATNA, BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's truly what happens if you're not able to reach an agreement. So say you have an employment negotiation. You have an interview with Google, or you have an offer from Google, you have an offer from Apple. You're negotiating with Apple for this because that's the one you really want. What's your BATNA? Your BATNA, if you can't get with Apple, is going to be to go and get employed with Google and to accept that agreement or negotiate that agreement further. So BATNA is commonly misunderstood. People think a lot of times that it's your walk away position. It is not your walk away position. It's what happens if you do not reach an agreement in that negotiation. So as we look through this, we have the positions and interests from the negotiation. We have the other parties' positions and interests from the negotiation, and we have our BATNA. Now the BATNA, there are possibilities that there are more than one BATNA. Now the person with the stronger BATNA could be a person that does better in the negotiation, but not always. If you've got someone that's properly prepared, even if they don't have a strong BATNA, but they're going into that negotiation with good process and good way of negotiating, they may come out ahead. They may maximize that value. But you want to look at those BATNAs and you want to rate them. What is my most feasible of those BATNAs? Maybe there's three or four. ZOPA is the next topic that I want to talk about, and it's your zone of possible agreement. It's really your bargaining range. So if you look at your ZOPA, it describes a zone in negotiations where an agreement can be met. So as you see here, you see the seller's range, you see the buyer's range, and in green there, you see that zone of possible agreements. Now what happens, you may be asking, if I get a negotiated agreement that's outside of that green range? Now most likely, you're not going to get an agreement. For instance, I was negotiating an Acura MDX, and in this particular case, I ended up negotiating $20,000 under sticker value. The salesperson was extremely flustered, clearly hadn't negotiated very long. And at the end of the day, he's ready to, he writes out the agreement and has it ready for me to sign. Now, 20,000 under sticker, the company would be losing a huge amount of money, right? We all know that. So obviously it wasn't gonna go through. I signed on the dotted line to see where this goes, right? I geek out over negotiations, so I wanted to see what specifically would happen. Now, at the end of the day, he brought this to his finance manager and his finance manager said, I have no idea what you did, but this is a no. Okay, so there was no agreement. We wasted significant time trying to get to that agreement, but because we were outside of that zone of possible agreement, no agreement could go forward. You want to make sure you understand what specifically that zone is so that you don't waste that time. Time is money, right? We don't have enough time in this world. We want to make sure that we're focusing and using that efficiently. So when we look at the next step, it's really looking at your personal SWAT. So organizing some of those intangibles that you have in the negotiation. With your strengths, you want to partner with those strengths. Those strengths are additional leverage that you have in this negotiation. The weaknesses are those unfavorable factors. You want to exploit those weaknesses in the negotiation. You want to explore your opportunities because those are truly opportunities for improved partnership between the two parties. And then those threats, those are areas of risk. So maybe you're negotiating international contract with China right now. With all the trade wars and things, that's a huge threat, right? You don't know where that's going to come. You want to be able to know how can I bring that into this negotiation and how can I gain leverage within that? So as we look at the SWAT, we fill in for each the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats. And we look at this from both our side as well as the other party's side as we're going through this to make sure that we're addressing because this is really where we're pulling our leverage out of. So how do you identify the negotiables? What are you truly negotiating for in that negotiation? Now, if we're looking at the employment agreement, a lot of us just focus on pay. 
So if we go into this negotiation, we're just focused on salary, we're missing a lot of other opportunities to maximize the overall value in that negotiation. So if I focus just on pay, I'm missing vacation time, I'm missing sign on bonus, I'm missing development opportunities, moving expenses, other things that may come into that overall employment agreement. The other area, if I'm looking at a product or service type of agreement, I'm looking at negotiables such as term of contract, payment terms, product service costs, intellectual property ownership. There's a lot of others under this. So you want to make sure that you're able to expand that pie. You want to figure out what additional areas can I look for that I truly need, as well as what additional areas could I give to the other party without being a detriment to my company. So as you'll see here, this is the negotiation planner for the negotiable side. You list out the negotiables, then you rank their importance. The reason that we rank their importance on this is because this is your scale for preparing how do I concede in a negotiation. There's going to be concessions given in a negotiation. The nice thing about this is you can actually put an importance ranking there so ahead of time you know what's most important to me. Now, if I have an important ranking, importance ranking of number one, I'm most likely not going to concede on number one, but I'm gonna concede on some of those other areas that are lower. So when I go into concession planning, and when I'm actually in that negotiation, I know which ones I can trade off, which is easier to know ahead of time than if I go in completely unprepared, I'm not ready to actually make those concessions, and I might actually give something away that I shouldn't have in that negotiation. You're also looking at what specifically is your opening position, what's your targets, and your least acceptable. Again, least acceptable is your least acceptable. It's your walk away. It is not your bad enough. The other area, putting back on our investigative negotiation hats that we need to focus on is what difficult questions can I ask the other party? This is just like if I'm going into an interview process, right? I put together the list of questions that I have for each of my interviewers. It's the same thing in a negotiation. What questions can I ask the other party? Now, because I've already prepped these questions, when we have a lull or when I need to get additional information, I already have my go-tos, right? Which means I'm actively listening to the other party throughout that negotiation, and I'm not missing any of that information. I also want to focus here on what are the difficult questions that I can expect from that other party. And the reason that I want to focus on that other party piece here is because I want to be prepared. I don't want any of my nonverbals to be tells within this negotiation, right? I want to make sure that at the end of the day, when we're going back and forth, I don't have any tells. As simple as a smile, when the other person gives you a certain cost savings can be a huge detriment, right? I've had negotiations where the person comes with a 1% cost savings. The other side was prepared for no cost savings. The person puts a smile on their face. Immediately the salesperson, being a great salesperson, steps in and says, I can see I made you happy, right? And uses that emotion or that expression that the other side didn't even know. So one of the things going into negotiation that I'm often asked is how do you prepare for those nonverbals, right? Because most of us do not have a poker face. Most of us have not spent time actually looking at what specifically those nonverbals are that we're telling or showing on a daily basis. So how do I actually look at that and how do I prepare effectively going into those negotiations? One of the best ways that you can do this is to record yourself. Now, one of the easiest ways, we're all on teleconferences, record yourself when you're doing a teleconference presentation. With whatever smartphone or smart device technology you wanna use, put it up on the shelf. While you're actually making that presentation or while you're in an active negotiation over the phone, it's a great opportunity for you to see what specifically was it that the other person asked me that, that I had these responses to. And what are those responses? And how do I go forward, put an action plan in place to make sure that I'm not having those tells as I go into these negotiations? So how do you create leverage? One of the quotes I like is, every reason the other side wants or needs an agreement is my leverage, provided that I know those reasons. Now this is huge, because so often we go into a negotiation and we don't think either we have the leverage or we don't know what that other side's leverage is. We want to be able to dig deeper and to understand what that is. Now, oftentimes I work with people and they say, I have no leverage in this. I'm on the sales side or I'm on the sourcing side. I have absolutely no leverage in this negotiation. But at the end of the day, two companies are talking. If they weren't talking, I may agree with you that you don't have much leverage. However, 
the other party is talking to you. Figure out, per this quote, what specifically it is that they want or need. There's a reason they're still talking. Make sure you're understanding what that reason is. The last area is looking at that leverage. So you want to know what your leverage is that you can bring against the other party because that's going to help you bring your position forward. And what's the other party's leverage that they have in that negotiation? So in this last part, what differentiates you, your position, your offer, your company? Because you need to be able to persuade effectively. Persuasion is a key technique in negotiation. So you want to know what value is it that I bring? What value is it that this particular company brings to you? Because if you're able to articulate succinctly what those messages are, you're able to start selling that other side on what specifically differentiates you from the competitor, right? Maybe you have very similar offers, but there's a differentiator in there that you wanna make sure you're bringing out. Make sure you're focused on what that is. Understanding your audience, as we talked about, is extremely important. One of the key things that I like is Strength Finders. Strength Finders, if you haven't done it, is through Gallup. There's a link here. But Strength Finders is nice because it lists out what are your top 34 strengths. Now, depending on which version of it you purchase, either your top five or your whole list of 34, nice thing about the whole list is you can look at what are my strengths and what are my opportunities, right? Down at the very bottom within that because those opportunities are the ones that usually in a negotiation are gonna get me in trouble especially if I'm negotiating with someone who's in stark contrast to how I am. Now, if I'm trying to effectively persuade someone, I'm gonna be focused on knowing specifically what type of person they are. Now, I'm not gonna go and ask them, you know, here's the Gallup survey, please fill this out before we negotiate. But I'm gonna be asking some of those questions, right? If I have someone that I'm negotiating with that's high in analytical, I want to understand how I best convey my message so that it's received by them. Right? I don't want it to go in one ear or out the other. I want to know what can I do to best position that. So if I find someone's high in analytical, maybe they're talking a lot about numbers, maybe they come with graphs or other things, I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna effectively mirror their behavior so that when I'm discussing it through with them, I'm talking in their language, right? I'm focused on how am I best gonna resonate that message with them. We also talked about the increasing social interaction. You wanna make sure that you understand what truly is motivating this person in this negotiation. Understand in each and every one of these negotiations, the words that were used fade, but those feelings, how that negotiation went, can I believe or can I trust that person in future negotiations continue to linger from one negotiation to the next to the next. And especially in collaborative negotiations where relationship is extremely important, it's gonna be extremely important to focus on that and to realize that as you go through. So the last quote I wanna leave you with is, to be good, you must learn to be yourself at the bargaining table. Tricks and strategies that don't feel comfortable won't work. Besides, while you're worrying about your next tactic, the other party is giving away vital clues and information that you're missing. It's extremely important that we focus not so much on those tricks or you know, small you know, one-time tactics that could be used in a negotiation. Much of what Hollywood shows us is negotiation, right? We need to focus on what truly is us. What's our authentic self as we go and negotiate because that's gonna to continue to come through and it's a small world in business. It's gonna to continue to come through in each and every one of those negotiations, whether it's with the same people or whether it's with parties who have done their due diligence to understand what happened in previous negotiations or what your style was, right? So you wanna understand what that is. So we do have a couple of upcoming sessions. For those of you that are interested in continuing on with the learning, this is just a small piece of what we teach, um, but I have two sessions that are coming up. I have one starting here in June and one starting in September. So it's strategies for effective negotiation at the executive education. <laughs> All right, so with that, actually Danielle, I'm gonna move Stay. you right to the center. <laughs> and we have some questions. So first of all, um, I know you all joined me in thanking Danielle for a truly great crash course in negotiation preparation. Um, we did get several questions, and like I say, I'm going to make sure we monitor the time so everyone can get to their 9 o'clock meetings. But here are a couple of questions if you're game to Sounds answer. Sounds great. All right. When you are in an environment where negotiation isn't an option, how can you encourage a negotiation discussion? 
So some of us have that experience where it's not something that they can actually work with either in their job or in their roles or it's something that they're told that they can't do. What I would suggest is use some of these collaborative techniques that we've talked through, right? A lot of what we've talked through today is asking those why questions, digging deeper and understanding what truly is that problem or conflict that exists. When you do this, you're not necessarily going to have that feel of that negotiation because a lot of people feel the negotiation is that that tactic going back and forth where it's extremely competitive. We're breaking that down to a conversation. I don't know any organizations that are going to say you can't have a conversation. Great, thank you. Um, the next question was, how long does it take to feel confident when negotiating? So great question around confidence in negotiations. How long does it take to feel confident in negotiations. Now, I'm gonna be very honest, it, it's a skill, right? It's something that with practice over and over, you're going to get more confident as you go. One of the things that I would highly suggest is that you focus specifically and do the preparation stage because that preparation stage will help you to be more confident. Also, Power of Presence is a great book. So for those of you who have not focused on this, Power of Presence is a great way of helping to build that confidence as well. But from the negotiation classes that I do here at the University of St. Thomas, one of the biggest ways that we do this and one of the best parts of the class is actually having the hands-on negotiation. So we're actually practicing the negotiation skills in a non-threatening environment and one where there's not something that you're going to lose at the end, right? If we do this in real life where we're trying to practice up, you know, oftentimes we're going to lose salary or we're going to lose something in that negotiation that's going to be a detriment to us. In the classroom, we don't lose that. So you're actually given the opportunity to work through that, which is extremely important. Great. Thank you. Um, where is it that people most often go wrong in a negotiation? So in a negotiation, the area that I most see people go wrong is the nonverbals because it's an area that lacks focus in negotiation. So many people focus on what's the technique and skill that I need to go into that negotiation, but they're not actually looking at what are those nonverbals? How do I come across to that other party based on my answers to questions? Am I having additional tells that I need to focus on? So I really focus on this area. All right, the next question is, what if I can't find information related to my negotiation topic? Oh. So this one, unfortunately, it depends, right? It depends on the negotiation topic that it is. What I would say is really on social media, understanding if there's any others in the organization that have negotiated within this particular topic. Because this is an extremely broad question, it's hard for me to narrow down specifically to this uh, succinct you know, issue that's at hand or you know, direct someone in where to go. But in this particular case, I would definitely recommend doing additional research and finding ways. There's a lot of information on Google. There's a lot of information is just in social media as well. Thank you. Um, next question. If you're not great at speaking on the spot, how can I mentally prepare for a negotiation? That's a great question. So the preparation that we just walked through will help you in those cases where you're not prepared. The other thing that I would suggest is not only going through this negotiation planner by yourself, but actually getting a colleague to sit down with you because they look at it differently, especially if it's from a different cross-functional area. They may think through things or have had different experiences that you want to bring into that negotiation. So it's able, you're able more to prepare for things that could come up in the negotiation so that you don't have to speak as much on spot because you're already prepared for it. All right, the next question. When negotiating over the phone, are there specific cues you can pay attention to even when you can't see someone? It's a great question. Uh, negotiating over the phone is obviously more difficult than in person, right? Because you can't view all those, or all those cues or nonverbals that you'd have. What I would pay close attention to is pauses. I would also listen to what's going on in the background. Because when you're talking, oftentimes you hear typing, you're hearing other things going on. So in those particular cases, you know the person's not technically listening to everything that you're saying, right? So be able to take breaks, be able to take control back in that negotiation to make sure that you're getting the focus that you need. All right, now this question is specifically related to salary. When negotiating a salary, how large of a range should you consider giving? Great question. Now, salary negotiations are a little bit more different than the negotiation techniques that I usually teach in class. And the reason I say this is most of the HR, not all, but most of the HR people that you're coming in contact with or the recruiters haven't been trained formally on negotiation. So when it comes to the maximizing the overall value of that negotiation, that's not really a focus. Their focus generally tends to be, let's split the difference. 
So what you'll see time and time again in those salary negotiations is you'll see we're splitting the difference. So you want a range that's high enough that when you split that difference, because that's usually the tactic that they take in those negotiations, that you're comfortable with whatever that split the difference uh, number would be. All right. So what is your go-to negotiation point when a supplier comes to you with a significant cost increase? So when you have a significant cost increase, you know, the number one thing that you want to say is no. You know, there's, there's no reason that we can do that right now. We have, you know, budget issues or other things going on. Um, but what you want to do is you want to dig deeper. Where specifically is this coming from? And what's the justification behind the numbers? Because so often we either push back or we don't push back or we push back, but we're not actually focused on where is this coming from? You know, is it matching commodity markets for maybe metals or whatever it may be, or is it not? Because in some of those cases, the other side isn't able to actually justify where that cost increase is coming besides just, well, it's something that we're doing as an initiative. So really dig deeper. All right, so how do you restart a negotiation when you're outside that zone? And how did you do that with your MDX? Great question. Um, so honestly, sometimes you are able to restart a negotiation. In this particular case, we weren't able to actually get to where we needed to be on the MDX. So in that particular case, you know, I tried to restart it. And I said, you're going to have to do more. Okay, I understand you're saying that this is outside the range, but you're going to have to do more than what you came back with a counter on because the other person came back with the counter. Now, in some cases, you will have to walk away because some cases walking away is better than signing a bad deal, right? Now, I walked away. I went to a different car dealership, had another competitive negotiation, and was able to get it under what the other uh, car dealership was wanting to offer. Um, but still not at that 20000 less than sticker price. All right. Um, how do you negotiate change in an environment that's changing so quickly? And you have to land on a deal, but everything's changing in such a complex way. Mm -hmm. And this is life, right? At the end of the day, things are constantly changing. We're constantly trying to keep up. The one area that I would say that we need to focus on is specifically what is changing. When we looked at the negotiation process, it was cyclical. We had to end up going back to that other stage from a planning and preparation standpoint. Sometimes have to take a break and go back to a previous stage to do some more preparation because of the changing atmosphere or environment and then renegotiate from there. All right. If you, things get heated, how do you manage to tap down that heated energy to get back to a productive place? So emotion and negotiation is one of the hot topics, right? A lot of people are either very emotional going into a negotiation or the other party is and we've got to figure out how to calm them down. If I have the other party that's overly emotional and I have to try to calm them down, oftentimes speaking very slow, trying to slow the pace of that down, making sure that I'm not giving them additional things that they can rebuttal. Because if they're not given additional fuel for the fire, that fire starts to simmer, right? At the end of the day, it's not going to blow out of control because eventually they're gonna start calming down. Make sure you still have eye contact with that person and that or those parties but make sure as you're negotiating with them that you're calm about that, your approach, you're slowing them down because they will essentially start mirroring your behavior as well. Sometimes it's so heated, you have to either take a break or you have to say, you know what, this is going in the wrong direction. We're going to have to come back to a different session all, entire, all in its entirety because it's just not going to work. All right, next question. Thank you. Yep. Um, so when you're negotiating and you get up to a point where you realize that you're in a compromising position and neither party is going to really achieve all of their goals, mm -hmm. how do you reframe it so you can find some extra value for everyone involved? So how do you reframe the negotiation? Uh, again, this one's extremely broad and it's hard to nail it down to specifically where it would be. Um, but how do you reframe? So when you're reframing, you're trying to figure out what specifically can I do differently about my approach or about how we're approaching this together. And sometimes you have to call it out. This isn't going anywhere. We need to try something different. Now, the one area that I really like is if you were in my shoes, what would you do? Because the reason that we do that is not only to get additional ideas, right, from the other side, but when the other side has those ideas that they've brought forward, they have ownership in them, right? At the end of the day, they're owning those ideas that they brought forward. So at the end of the day, you're able to start moving past some of those barriers that were established. All right. Well, um, we promised to get people to their 9 o'clock meetings. Great. So um, first of all, I want to thank you again for joining us today for our summer online learning series kickoff.
Um, as Danielle mentioned, she has her upcoming course starting next Thursday, um, and we hope to see some of you there. In addition, um, our next summer online learning series is on Wednesday, July 17th on design thinking. Um, thank you for spending a little time with us and having a cup of coffee and we hope to see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.